It is 7 p.m. Eastern time. And my name is John Bell. I'm the director of the Ballard Institute and Museum of Puppetry uh, at the University of Connecticut in stores. Connecticut, I'm not in stores, um, but uh, we're here uh, on online for our first spring puppet forum of the 2021 semester, spring semester. My colleague, Emily Wicks, the manager of collections and operations is, is here with me doing everything, making everything happen. And we're really pleased this, uh, this evening to, to begin with our first forum, Puppetry in Therapy with Matthew Bernier and Sandra uh, Trefulius, Sandy. And I thought before we get right to that, I would mention that this is part of a whole series of puppet forums we're beginning for the semester. They will include um, actually more than we normally do in a semester. There'll be six more of these. Is that right? Five more of these uh, with uh, director Madeline Sayet, uh, who's the of head of the Yale Indigenous Performing Arts Program. We're hoping to do one on First Nations object, object performance. Don't have the date uh, for that fixed yet. On March 25th, Thursday, March 25th, we're going to do puppetry and spirituality with Claudia Ornstein and Tim Cusack from the uh, uh, City University of New York, CUNY Graduate Center and Ana Martinez and Deepsika Chatterjee. On April 8th, uh, Youngman Sung, our colleague from the School of Fine Arts, a uh, professor here, will be talking about her exhibition, Misrepresentations of Race, Race, Ethnicity, and Puppetry, which is going to be the next exhibition going up in our museum. On April 22nd, um, Eddie Kim of EK Theater and Samantha Olshin and Kenneth Thompson from our Digital Media and Design Department at, at UConn will talk about puppetry, game design, and digital performance, beep, beep, beep. And on May 6th, for our last one, uh, we're, we'll be honored to have Chiminda Kawandaragala from Minneapolis, who's gonna talk about access to puppetry and her work with Monkey Bear Studios in Minneapolis, uh, opening up the field of puppetry to, to folks and communities who aren't, haven't typically been, um, uh, part of that. So this is uh, going to be an exciting uh, uh, period of, of or some season of, of puppet forums here. Also, I wanted to mention we're going to sponsor or bring to you on April 9th and 10th a international symposium representing alterity through puppetry and performing objects, which is gonna talk about the way puppets around the world and throughout history have represented different populations, ethnic ethnicities and races and what that means. That'll be very exciting. The, uh, one of our graduate students, our, our graduate assistant Felicia Cooper will be performing her MFA project um, on, I didn't write down the dates, in uh, March 18th, 19th, and 20th, or I think we added the 21st, outdoors uh, in, in downtown stores uh, on the town square in a socially distant public health uh, safety performance, a new show-ish, uh, which will be very exciting. March 18th through 20th outdoors and March 21st online. And uh, I mentioned the new exhibition that Min is curating. Very exciting, so much going on. I teach a class called Introduction to World Puppetry, which is about, it's a gen ed class for about puppetry around the world. And towards the end of it, after looking at puppetry and history and puppetry as um, art and puppetry as politics and puppetry uh, and music and puppetry uh, in, in, in different global studies contexts, we turn to look at puppetry and therapy and suddenly everything shifts because puppetry has, when you think about it, kind of obvious therapeutic effects. I think us puppeteers think of that. But wh when we shift and talk about how puppets can be used in therapeutic situations by people who are qualified to do that, 
then we're looking at a kind of different uh, area of puppetry, which is totally fascinating, kind of related to puppetry and education, which is another fascinating area. And I use an essay in that part of my course uh, from Matthew Bernier's book, Puppetry and Education and Therapy, Unlocking Doors to the Heart and Mind. So I'm really glad we're here with Matthew and Sandra, Sandy. Uh, Chafulius, who's a colleague here at UConn. She is a licensed psychologist. Uh, I guess this is when we bring on our friends into the, into the mix, if you want to turn on your cameras. Hi, Sandy. Hi. S hi. He, uh, Sandy is a licensed psychologist and works as a distinguished professor in the NIAG School of Education here at UConn. She directs the Collaboratory on Ch School and Child Health and authors a Psychology Today blog on promoting student well being. Her work focuses on assisting schools in implementation of evidence informed policies and practices that support the whole child with specific expertise and strategies to strengthen mental, mental health and emotional well being. And uh, Dr. Chafulius has worked as a school psychologist and administrator in a variety of settings supporting the needs of children with behavior disorders. And Sandy's in Vermont where there's snow. Well, there's snow in Cambridge, Massachusetts where I am too. And I guess there's snow in Connecticut where Emily is, I don't know about Virginia where Matthew Bernier is right now. Matthew oh, yeah. is, <laughs> D is a registered and board certified art therapist, artist, puppeteer, and associate professor in graduate art therapy and the counseling program, uh, the art therapy and counseling program at Eastern Virginia Medical School, where he's been teaching since 1990. He has a bachelor's degree in psychology with a minor in theater arts and a master's degree in creative arts in therapy from Hanuman University uh, in uh, now Drexel University and pursuing a PhD in expressive arts therapy and social change at the European Graduate School in Switzerland. And his expertise is in the areas of psychological development theories, therapeutic art processes, the expressive therapies continuum, uh, creative symbolism, metaphor, and a variety of other approaches I mentioned to you uh, his co-editing of the book, Puppetry and Education and Therapy, Unlocking Doors to the Heart and Mind. So welcome to both of you, Sandy and Matthew. We wanna have a really interesting discussion. I mean, I know it's gonna be interesting and um, <clears throat> we will wanna include um, questions and feedback from those uh, who are uh, watching online I do want to say regarding that aspect of our amazing diffusion system through the interwebs uh, that this video, a video of this forum will be available afterwards on Facebook, uh, the, our Facebook page and on our YouTube channel, our Ballard Institute YouTube channel. <coughs> Excuse me, and I would like to add that we're making all of our online programming free as we've done since last March, since COVID started, <clears throat> free and accessible online. If you would like to support this event and our other workshops, forums, and performances, which are all online, you can please make a contribution uh, to the, uh, the link that probably my colleague Emily will post on our um, Facebook chat. Uh, it's a it's a long link. I will not read to you the URL. <laughs> so um, uh, what we wanted to start with, with Matthew, uh, and uh, I, I think it's going to be interesting to uh, check with both of you how you got into therapy and how puppetry relates to that. Sandy's been involved with using puppets in her therapeutic practices, but isn't a puppeteer, although in a way we're all puppeteers. <laughs> but not a puppeteer, and Matthew is a puppeteer. Mm -hmm. Matthew has a, a, a PowerPoint presentation actually about, about different aspects of this. So we wanted to ask Matthew to, um, to present that. And maybe if I could uh, ask, you know, ask you to just briefly explain how you 
became a puppeteer and how you became a therapist sure. before you jump into your presentation. Okay, sure. So um, my interest in puppetry literally goes all the way back to kindergarten. So I was one of those kids who played with puppets and uh, was beginning to make puppets at a very young age. Um, and um, I think I always liked storytelling. I was the talker, always telling stories, but finding ways to tell them with objects and puppets seem very natural as many kids do in child play. And um, when I was around 11 or 12, I was fortunate to join a club in New York City, which happened to be the Puppetry Guild of Greater New York uh, with uh, quite notable puppeteers there. So I was one of these youth members um, around the likes of um, uh, Rod Young and Bernice <laughs> and uh, Silver and you know, learning all about puppetry in a professional way. Um, as I went through high school and college, I became interested in psychology and um, began to think about the idea of perhaps puppets or puppetry could be incorporated into therapy work. Um, I discovered art therapy as a profession and realized that um, that was probably a way to tie these things together. Um, back in 81, when I became an art therapist, drama therapy was on the forefront, but it really wasn't um, too uh, active yet. And expressive arts therapy was existing in Massachusetts, but uh, this is long before the internet and it was hard for students back then even to know of one profession or, or school over another sometimes. So perhaps I might've gone in that direction in drama therapy or expressive arts because I was integrating the arts already with puppetry being an integrative art form. Um, at any rate, I did my master's thesis on puppetry in um, art therapy. So, so that became a focus and like most, um, it sort of follows you. So ever since I found opportunities to play with um, concepts and principles and techniques of puppetry in therapy with all ages, preschool through the elderly um, and um, have continued ever since. Since I began teaching, I've had opportunity to supervise graduate level interns working in a variety of settings and some, not all, but some have experimented with the use of puppets. And um, so that's given even broader ideas about ways that puppetry could be utilized in, in various settings and across, you know, across the populations, different age groups. So that's kind of the short version. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Good. And I should jump in at this moment and say, yeah. I forgot to mention that this event is, is co-sponsored by the NEAG School of Education um, at UConn, where, where Sandy is, is affiliated, where Sandy is part of, where she directs um, uh, the program that she's uh, directing, the UConn Collaboratory on School and Child Health. So Matthew, do you want to jump into your fascinating sure. PowerPoint presentation? Um, yeah. Um, I. I I will say that this uh, PowerPoint focuses specifically on more um, contemporary tabletop techniques. Um, uh, you know, lots of uh, contemporary puppetry. Um, well, contemporary puppetry crosses all different styles of puppetry. And I got fascinated with tabletop technique because it really parallels the natural tendency of children to play with things, you know, on the floor, on the tabletop, in their lap. Um, and it, and it it's, uh, takes you away from the traditional stage, the booth stage that you might expect with hand puppets or the overhead work with, um, with marionettes. I started out myself with playing with hand puppets or marionettes. Um, and I also found the benefit of working with simple, simple materials, making super simple puppets with familiar materials that lent itself to making tabletop figures. So um, if we go to the... The next slide. Um, I'm not the first one to think this way, and there are related techniques and therapies such as sand play or sand tray, all the way back to the 1930s. So the British pediatrician slash pioneer in child psychology, child play therapy, Margaret Lowenfeld, developed what she called the world technique. Um, this literally looks like a drawer out of uh, the desk, right? Um, filled with sand, the interior painted blue. So if you move the sand, you see water. And then shelves filled with miniatures that you could play with in the sand and construct scenes. Not only is this a form of play, but often these scenes are photographed or sketched and then referred to later in um, other aspects of therapy. So if we move along, um, we see that um, she was studying children's play, 
developing the ideas of um, using this technique, which then became called sand play. Um, she also was interested in playing with blocks. Again, a natural tendency for kids to build and construct. So block play. Uh, next slide. Great. So contemporary uh, therapists, whether they be psychotherapists, creative arts therapists, or play therapists might use either on the left, um, hundreds of little miniatures and scenes in the sand tray, or it might even be more like sand and water play, which we find more like an early childhood education, where it's more like playing with concepts, uh, a cognitive development of, you know, pouring things in, pouring things out, burying things in the sand, finding them. But either way, there's story. Kids often narrate their play. So let's go to the next slide. So you see examples of both here on the left is a traditional sand tray. And on the right would be sand and water play. Um, so they're different, but yet often related because there is story development, language, concept formation, all things that are necessary in development. Um, and then here's Margaret with block play on the left and then a contemporary book still on block play and, um, and creating scenes or worlds. And here's a contemporary um, uh, puppet artist in Finland, uh, Rosa Hame, um, who creates a wonderful um, nonverbal uh, performance to music where she starts with a single block and then different shapes that build. She creates figures, um, architecture, urban scenes, country scenes, um, and, and continues to develop the story non-verbally through block play. She also then does workshops with people using their own sets of blocks that they create figures, families, stories, scenes, and so forth. And so um, she's a good example of someone who's seeing the potential um, healing or therapeutic value of the arts and trying to wrestle with who can do this related kind of work. If you're a puppeteer and performer, can you do this work? Or is it relegated only to credential therapists? And in Finland, they came up with the idea of working pairs where they will have like a therapist um, spend time with a puppeteer and actually do projects uh, in settings together. Um, and then um, people like Virginia Axline who've written, uh, who've written a lot about play therapy and what's referred to more as a non-directive or humanistic or person-centered kind of work, um, but really taking the lead again from children's natural tendency to play and to direct their own work in their therapy. And so, so you might be familiar with some of these ideas or these books if you're a therapy students or practitioners. Um, and then um, a contemporary artist who, uh, a theater artist, director, actor in Argentina, who has decided to take his theater world to tabletop. And this is Pablo Gershonik and um, his work looks a lot like model train boards, you know, and um, he's really interested in the map, the map of the town. Where did something happen? Where did a trauma take place? Uh, taking the lead off of his own personal trauma and um, then showing how that all looks, his memories, what buildings does he remember? What people were there? Uh, walking around to see it at all different angles and even the aerial view, the bird's eye perspective. These are techniques that are used in trauma work um, where you get the close up, sort of the filmmaker perspective, the panoramic view, the aerial view. Sometimes we purposely ask people to mentally um, reconsider their experience from these different vantage points. He's doing it live tabletop. And so I find this very, very interesting work, um, very akin to object puppetry and tabletop puppetry and therapeutic work. He works with individuals, groups, and community. Um, so um, here's just some examples. Um, you know, what does tabletop puppetry look like on the left? Very typically, you see the performer in therapy, the client is the performer. You see the, their working process playing with objects and, and um, puppets. Um, even a wonderful book by uh, Fong Kaplan. Um, I got lots of ideas on tabletop work from this book. Um, uh, another typical, you know, what does tabletop look like? Um, we see it played out before our eyes, typical to children's play. Um, and then, um, so I wrestled with, well, how could therapists perhaps who, who don't have full training in puppetry, you know, in a setup in their own spaces, maybe they could get a cart and drape it and you know play tabletop that way. Um, and then in Switzerland, um, next slide, um, I found they were using these wonderful old ironing boards as their play space and even putting several of them uh, next to each other to create moving 
spaces between here and there. Um, on the right, a decorator magazine image, you know, that filled with objects and kind of for us in puppetry screams object theater, object puppetry. We want to make scenes with these these objects as characters. So we can um, next slide. We can we can drape these. We can uh, next slide. We can layer um, boxes and le create levels. We can throw in um, plastic bits to become water, um, uh, fabrics to become greenery or sand. Um, next, we can um, create. Um, I often offer often uh, offer baskets of things, so dolls or figures that are made with wire or cardboard or um, fabric dolls, or on the right, um, objects that are um, various bottles of sorts um, that, that have sort of human shape or figure. And um, clients can select these. I've played with the Russian and Slavic ragdoll techniques of not sewing into fabric, no needle piercing through for uh, rather religious or superstitious reasons, actually. But um, I like the idea of only folded and tied and very simple, a child could make these figures and um, in, in quickly in single session, make figures that come to life immediately. So immediacy is a real important aspect of puppetry and therapy, um, not long-term projects, but rather how can we bring the character and the story to life quickly in time and space? Um, next slide, I think has more examples of these. So playing with found materials. Um, sometimes people do memori memorialized um, figures, uh, they'll bring in, fabrics of uh, loved ones who have passed, uh, clothing even, and cut them up and create dolls and puppets and figures that we can use in these uh, therapy sessions. And um, also we use a technique of wrapping quilt batting around um, pipe cleaners and a figure literally materializes in your hand. We use this a lot in physical uh, uh, hospital settings of patients in the bed doing therapy bedside and they can work in a sort of a clean way with clean materials and work on a figure that suggests what's going on inside their body or what's happened to their body if there've been changes in their, their body image or self-concept because of procedures or um, complications medically what's happened. So these figures become really essential in that kind of work. Uh, next please. Um, I found this uh, wonderful artist in Paris, Junior Fritz, um, uh, Jacquet, and he works with toilet paper tubes, um, such a simple throwaway, and look at the artistry that he does with them, sort of origami-like, sort of sculptural-like, and then envision, well, these would make great scale puppet heads on my, you know, wrapped figures, so let's wed them together. So as an artist, I'm always looking at integrating art forms. As expressive artists, I'm also integrating music, movement, poetry, looking all different ways that these art forms come together in sort of a whole person, whole, whole expression kind of way. So um, I get excited when I find these artists that are working in ways that, oh, I could borrow that, you know. Um, I think teaching does that as well. Um, we can change the scene in terms of time and weather. That's not a blurred slide. That's actually black tool fabric draped over. So suddenly it's nighttime. And then we whisk it away and suddenly it's daytime or we throw the lace over it, suddenly it's snowing, or we pull that away and suddenly it's, the sun is out and it's, and it's dry. Um, so these are things that we can do um, to create, again, immediacy in the moment, interchangeable, the clients make their puppets or they borrow orphan puppets that others have made. Um, they can change or rearrange the puppets so they're not store-bought, um, they're, maybe they're precious. These are not treated as precious, they can, um, they, I don't name the characters, the clients will name them. Um, they can take on many roles, just like an actor can take on many, many characters, many roles. So I'm, I'm borrowing from all of our theater and um, related arts traditions in this way of therapeutic puppetry. Okay. Um, again, uh, this is the, the bottle family on the left. Dawn is the mom. She was married to Brawny, but Brawny was violent and she got out of the house and um, do, uh, her daughter Joy and her son Hungry Jack, who's always hungry, were having some mood problems and ang anger and behavior management problems. And Jack narrates the story and asks, what would you do if, what would you do if your parents were fighting? What would you do if your dad left? What would you do if your mom had a new guy in her life? She was dating Scott and I use uh, paper towel rolls and they become the objects. And so I'm adding humor and pun into actually a serious kind of 
story. And then I can actually stop the action and ask kids, what might happen next? And they might um, be invited to play the story. So you take the characters down, we'll do role reversals and they can play it their version and change it up. And so we have so much flexibility with puppets and therapy this way. And this is just a state of the art you know, trying to teach some of these skills actually sometimes um, online. So I'm, I'm fortunate this semester teaching um, one of my courses in person, but with a smaller group teaching sections of it and uh, incorporating puppetry, mask and doll work in that. But last semester in the heart of, of, of the beginning of COVID, I was doing this online and was pleasantly surprised that even through the com computer screen, um, students were able to catch on and, and build puppets and capture these ideas. So um, I think this might be the end. Um, there's always references. And uh, if anyone's interested in these uh, on your own, you could perhaps email me. I'd love to pass on uh, information about them for you. Um, you could look up uh, Rosa's work online. She gives this explanation. And then the last line, I think, is uh, Pablo's. Um, also some information about him. Just uh, Google them. You'll find wonderful websites and information about them. All right, so that's a whirlwind tour. Right. Um, of the tabletop stuff, um, I would just add that um, puppetry is more often not a talking, puppets can talk, but they also really are a movement. Puppets are a movement like mime and, and dancers, uh, art form. And so a lot of my work also includes movement and nonverbal and, and working in free space and not being uh, bound behind a, a puppet booth. And working with adults, I often incorporate mask and movement. Okay, so I'll I, stop there. Wow, I appreciate that. That's a, an amazing presentation, Matthew. I really appreciate understanding sort of the depth and history of um, uh, puppetry and, and therapy. And also, you know, as a puppeteer, um, as a puppeteer who's performing or, or making puppet shows for entertainment and I guess education, it's interesting to me to see the same techniques or the same types of puppets doing something in addition or right. a bit different from what we think we're doing as puppeteers right. presenting a story. Right. I, I appreciate your mentioning um, Theater on a Tabletop, which is co-authored by a Yukon Puppet Arts graduate and my yeah. colleague from our great small works company, Stephen Kaplan, with his wife, Kwong Yu Fong. And also when you were talking about um, the work of Pablo Gershanek, um, it reminded me of a performance I saw by the Dutch company Hotel Modern called Comp about the Auschwitz concentration camp. And it was a huge, it was on the floor, but a huge layout of Auschwitz with little figures performing a day in the life of Auschwitz. Yeah. And it was sort of overwhelming. The audience I saw it with at um, St. Anne's Warehouse in Brooklyn was to a degree made up of concentration camp survivors. And my, the experience was very different uh, for me than a normal puppet show. And, and yeah. s s the word therapy, seeing it as a therapeutic event for people suffering trauma or trauma, that makes sense to me the way you were talking about that. Like, so that yeah. wasn't like an artistic puppet object performance that was also um, addressing trauma and therapeutic in that way. And sometimes yeah. I think, well, puppetry is kind of doing that all the time. Anyway, right. I have random thoughts about puppetry and therapy and, and Sandy um, has organized <clears throat> thoughts and brilliant yeah. uh, insights into this. So I wanted to ask Sandy um, how you, uh, got, well, not that you have to do an autobiography, but how did you come to uh, the world of puppetry and your world of therapy? Well, so mine is a very short history compared to Matthew's, I guess. Although, of course, I was a Muppet generation person myself, right? And a Mr. Rogers generation. So I grew up um, similar to Matthew with the experiences of being uh, around puppets and seeing puppets as part of my learning experiences. Um, so my own work, and then I wanted to get back into some comments on, on some of Matthew's uh, um, space. I'm a school psychologist by training. I work with kids and adults and really in school settings, which adds another layer of 
interest to how you might use puppets and what are the um, kind of limits of what you use in therapy. So I wouldn't describe myself as a puppeteer, certainly, although I appreciated the nod that you said we're all puppeteers in our own way. Um, but I have used puppets in my practice um, either to engage communication, so particularly in, we're in assessment purposes, um, especially with younger kids, and we're trying to get through these, these different assessment situations to understand what they know. Uh, puppets become a really normal space or a normal thing under tables to, to get at, at where you're going and, and what you're doing. Um, but probably most importantly, in terms of, uh, I find puppets to be a very good mechanism with kids for teaching and learning. So I know that, um, which is part of therapy uh, in terms of um, how we are using puppets to model. So students are, uh, uh, children are doing observational learning and then to practice and give feedback particularly in my area of love, which is teaching social and emotional skills. Um, you have a nonverbal opportunity to learn about emotions through puppets, you know, identify behaviors, label emotions. Um, again, particularly for students maybe who have special needs that might not be, that might struggle with different uh, modes of communication. Uh, puppets become a very helpful um, tool to uh, foster cooperation. Um, and the research has borne out that the combination of adding a puppet curriculum into uh, different classroom strategies for teaching and learning ha have found to be effective. And also for, for kids in terms of being able to identify emotions and kind of not react as, uh, to or negatively to different situations to, to cope better, but also in terms of teachers being able to implement more positive ways of managing their classrooms. So that's my, my short story. I'm, what I loved about Matthew's conversation, if you heard across all of the different techniques and these amazing puppeteers that that I that I, some of which I learned about today, is that a key place uh, within all of it is this idea of of play that you that you learn through play, right? Um, and that you do that again, teaching and learning. The therapy is all about learning, right? And learning about what what's what's happening, define it, um, and where we go from there. But the key piece to that play is that it's done in a space where there's psychological safety. It's a positive climate for learning in a supportive, non-threatening way. Um, puppets really can become that, that mediating space. Um, when I was thinking about what I wanted to say in this, I, I kept thinking about how tired I am at the end of the day right now with Zoom, right? And just staring at a screen all day long. And there's actually some, some uh, I read, had read an article and I forgot to pull it up for today, that talks about how taxing it is because we're not wired to have to look directly at um, another person face on because right. it's, a, it's a threatening, it's part of our fight or flight. So if you think about how tired you are at your end of the day, right? And you translate to that to puppets, you, you, take that, um, you take that threat away in many ways, right? You, 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 you're able to have conversations um, about things that are going on. Um, try things out in a non-personal way, a non-personal way without fear of being criticized or that you're doing it wrong. So um, I, that's what I would say. And I have a million questions I'd like to ask Matthew as we go along too. Yeah. I'm happy to add in different perspectives. Yeah, thank you, Sandy. It's so fascinating to hear what you just said about the value of this separation and, and how, which I think is, as pup, puppet artists, we, we were aware of the, the value of putting emotion and passion and story into an object rather than human, the, the human form. Mm -hmm. I, th I think maybe for me as a, um, uh, you know, as a civilian, as it were, uh, thinking about therapy, think some of the things I think about uh, uh, in terms of Matthew's presentation and what you just had, Sandy, are, you know, how does how does it work? Like we know about uh, different approaches. For example, earlier Matthew wrote about art therapy and expressive arts therapy, counseling, play therapy, drama therapy, um, and uh, yeah. you also mentioned community arts and arts for social action. Or, or justice, and I'm I'm kind of wondering, uh, as someone who doesn't know, like how do puppets and work in each of those different types of therapy, and what is it exactly that they do that 
that uh, therapeutic practices which don't use puppets wouldn't do or wouldn't be able to do? Like, what what exactly is going on there? You know, like I'm I'm fascinated to understand why puppetry is useful in these in these different contexts, and maybe we yeah. should talk about the different various sure. different contexts in which this happens. But, you know, I think um, so many therapists um, have puppets around, in a, uh, especially child therapists, right, will just have ready-made puppets available. And often the use of the puppets is not because the therapist introduces it, but simply makes it accessible and the clients see them and want to make use of them. And, um, but it really could be any age. It doesn't have to be only um, a child. Um, I heard just yesterday of a, um, a patient in the hospital who played with his food. Um, he had uh, chunks of avocado and feta cheese and he's told the whole story between um, what was going on in, in, in his world, a battle scene between these characters um, in, 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 in the sea of olive oil. And uh, he was the captain of the ship and so forth. The whole story played right in his hospital bed. Um, so, so uh, not only play, but imagination and creative expression, creativity, I mean, it all goes together. So I think that um, often it's just having it um, accessible, but um, as an art therapist, we're more likely to even suggest you might want to make a character um, and here are some materials or here's a process technically of how to build a puppet. Sometimes it starts with a drawing or a clay figure and we will use other art processes or a collage with magazine photos, for instance or even phototherapy where we use photographs of actual self or family members. And then we might cut those out and put them on a stick and it becomes quickly a movable animated character and play like toy theater style. Um, or it might be, let's build a puppet now in another fashion with other materials based on those original sketches or original. So we kind of leapfrog from one art form into the other. Um, it all depends on goals. It depends on motivation depends on um, forms of expression, styles of learning, uh, personality, you know, there's so many things. Um, uh, I would so guess interests of the clients yeah. too. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean yeah. to interrupt you. No, no, perfect. Yeah. You know, I was fascinated because yeah. I know that you've really worked with puppets across the life course. And I was yeah. wondering if you found certain forms are, are better with different populations or is it just yeah. dependent on the individual? I have found to have a variety of puppet types and puppet styles available or with uh, some examples to give sort of the idea for the non-puppeteer client, of course, right? What they, they might only be familiar with the Muppets, let's say, or they know what a hand puppet looks like. But if I start um, moving a character, I want to reach for one of my puppets here now. So, so if, I, if I take this very simple tabletop figure that's literally made out of grocery bags, and I'm going to try to hold him in a way that you can see him, but he's literally made out of grocery bags and um, with some sticks to move the arms or the legs, and he can walk across a scene. Um, if I just demonstrate that once, then people say, oh, wow, that's so cool. I want to try that too. Show me how to build one of those. And so then we'll start, we usually think of the idea of low skill, high sensitivity. So starting very, very simple, simple materials, simple technique, and you like that, do you wanna move up to a higher level? Let's, what could we add? What would make it better? And so we play in that kind of fashion. And so really it's about um, sort of introducing a notion and letting the client kind of get that. And if it registers, they may go with that and we can challenge and encourage to go further or Maybe they say, not for me. And then of course, as a therapist, I have lots of other tricks up my sleeve, other kinds of techniques and processes that we use. Um, but there are so many different ways that uh, puppetry can grab people. Um, so whether it's small and intimate or whether it's like this kind of character, which is large, which could be mm -hmm. played on a broomstick way over your head. You know, you can make giants and monsters. This is a soda bottle with a sock pulled over it and just a a mop as a wig. That's and, fascinating. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, making quick bodies with fabrics and yeah. working collaboratively where you have two or three people manipulate the, the figure in space, collaborative work. So we literally are taking, you know, an ancient Japanese bunraku puppetry and turning it into immediate work in therapy. And this is how I borrow 
from tradition. So it's fascinating to me to take the the way that you just described the introduction to <laughs> puppets and showing the, the the experience to see if there is engagement to want to practice. Right. Because uh, again, in my world, you know, in teaching and learning, that's the, those are the basic components to, to effective instruction. Yeah. You yeah. start by modeling. I'll do yeah. it, and then maybe we'll do it together, and then you'll right. do it, and I'll give you that that some, right. some, and we'll work on feedback, and that's where the the emotion right. and the and the discussion comes in. So it's the same. It's a different language, but it's the same principles or the same mechanisms. Yeah. I guess is what we're. Yeah, and in terms of puppet building and puppet manipulation, <clears throat> or I actually prefer now to use the term animation, um, and I think that works better in therapy. Anima really means soul. Psychotherapy is attending to the soul. So it all kind of comes together historically and linguistically. But at any rate, um, I often will show half-made, not completely made puppets. So I'll show, this is one I'm starting to work on. What do you think? It'll just show enough of the mechanism. How does it operate? And then let the client run with it. So, so they're not following it like it, mine is gonna look exactly like yours. So their own personal expression can come to the forefront. So I just, wanna, oh, go, sorry, oh, go, ahead no, finish. go ahead. Don't wanna, you do. I was just gonna say, I'm really also struck by the fact that you keep talking about any material can be used in doing this. So to me, that's yeah. a really critical space to think about, particularly um, in the pandemic now, and, and we're seeing yeah. disparities um, be, be, that were always there be magnified and highlighted for us. So it, it's something that anybody can find a way to do. Yeah, in so some this form. started out as a box of Raisin Bran, okay? Mm -hmm. So any box cut on three sides and fold it will make a mouth puppet. Mm -hmm. This is great when the puppet has to bite and spit and say awful things. Um, so having a mouth kind of suggests what one does with that mouth. Where, whereas puppets that have um, hands or have legs, you know, what can the figure do um, that maybe is part of that story or what's the part of the, the learning that needs to take place? So yeah, using all sorts of materials. I like to offer a range of materials, beautiful, brand new, as well as sort of grubby, wrinkled, torn, tattered, people find themselves across the range of materials. So I'm really interested in the aesthetic, not to force an aesthetic, but to have the client find their aesthetic. What, how, what's the mood they're trying to convey? How do they feel? What materials do they think would suggest what it is they're trying to convey? So if all I have is pretty brand new things, then that's, uh, you know, that's a forced look. But if I have a, an assortment of scale, texture, colors, and materials, then they can play, they, there's a discovery. They go through the materials and discover the character, discover the qualities that they're, um, in, they're, they're expressing. I, Inner I self wanted, to outer self, right? I wanted to ask, a, a, maybe it's a basic question about therapy. And, and I realize uh, I'm, I'm, think, I'm thinking, oh, am I talking about counseling? Is counseling the same as therapy? But- um, Nowadays it is. <laughs> The, in, uh, They're often used interchangeably nowadays, you know, more often than not. My sense of therapy is that, you know, talking therapy is that, and, and it's interesting because you're using the term client and which was sort of like, that's, which is interesting. Um, and we think about puppeteers, performers and audiences, but um, my sense is that the goal of therapy is for the therapist to uh, communicate with the client and um, have a get a better understanding of what's happening with the client. And I'm assuming that, you know, the, uh, you know, there's some challenge that the, that person is facing and that the therapist and talking to that person will understand that and I'm, just, I'm thinking maybe be able to offer some uh, amelioration or something. Right. That's what I'm thinking it is. And then with the play here, I, you know, puppets, what happens in terms of puppetry? Like is in terms of play therapy, is it that the, the, the counselor or therapist watches the, the play with objects and then is able to analyze what's going on? Or is it just that play itself is, is a positive thing for the person to do? Or when you're watching, I'm thinking that the therapist is kind of watching and learning what the client does with puppets. 
Are you sort of drawing conclusions, you know? Inferences. Wh yeah. um, what exactly is this process here? What are you as therapists learning? What is the person, the client person uh, yeah. doing? So I'll let Matthew take that one for sure. But one thing I would, uh, I guess, uh, correct John, or maybe like okay. amplify in there is, it's not always about a therapist analyzing what's right for the client. So let's right. think about that frame yeah. for a second. The therapist yeah. is the, the conduit, much like yeah. I guess a puppet could be, right? To yeah. helping uh, discover solutions. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's more like a, it's a helper, not a director. I guess yeah. I want to just think about that as framing the role a little bit differently when we think yeah. about therapy. Does that help? And then I'll, I yeah. don't know if Matthew wants to add from that or say something yeah, abs different. Absolutely. Well, first of all, just a quick overview that there are a variety of theoretical approaches and your original use of the word analyze would be more of a psychoanalytic point of view. Um, but that's now considered more old school. But play therapy evolved out of Anna Freud and Melanie Klein's work in England um, playing this way where the therapist did sit back and watch and take notes and then say, mm-hmm, and then make interpretations, you seem angry, you know? And so that was the way that it was, you know, instead of laying on the couch and talking, the child played, but it still was very much like a, a verbal therapy. But nowadays we have broader approaches that include cognitive behavioral work, transpersonal mm -hmm. work, humanistic work, where the therapist might even play the story with the client, side-by-side -side relational work, building on attachment um, processes, um, reparation of attachment problems. Um, so, you know, um, parent-child symbolically uh, repairing that in therapy work. Um, so, so it depends also on the therapist training, the school where they went, what kind of therapy they learned. They might have learned, like at my school, across the spectrum of approaches. Mm -hmm. And then um, the language changes as do the goals and the techniques according to the different approaches. Nowadays, we think more integrative approaches. Nowadays, we think of having a toolbox of all sorts of ways of working. And you dip into that depending on uh, where and how you're working. So is it short-term brief work? Do you right. have a long time to work? Are you doing depth-oriented work dealing with trauma? Or are you, you know, kind of having to do something that's solution-focused here and now? So yes. um, we have a lot of tools at our disposal. So, so to answer John, your first question, the answer is yes, yes, and yes. It's all of those things and it <laughs> depends. Um, so therapists are trained to sort of pick up on, huh, this is a person who I need to work more experientially. There's not gonna be a lot of depth talk or not a lot of vocabulary, or this is a person who's really stuck at talking up in a cognitive way. That part of their brain is activated. Can I bring them down into our, um, kinesthetic and sensory modes of operating and, and actually purposely have no talk, maybe only nonsense and sound um, and, and work in movement. So, so we can walk, work across uh, modes of expression which, which mirror modes of functioning in the brain. So nowadays we often take a more neuro-informed approach and also a trauma-informed approach to work. And um, therapists or uh, contemporary therapists are more schooled in these different ways of working. So puppetry can find its way more and more, not less and less, but more and more in each of these ways of working because there is you know, a, a way to tie that in. So it, for me, it's just very exciting to see how we can find the applications. Yeah, we have a, a number of good- A lot of questions. Lot yeah. of questions. <laughs> and You're real active, okay. I think like, I think a question, I, and I, I don't necessarily, I'd rather go to the questions to the audience, but I'm thinking like, like for me, puppetry is therapeutic because, and I think for all of us puppeteers, just because as an activity, the way Sandy was talking about it, like it's sort of a relief to focus on this object. And I think I wonder in the therapeutic situation, is it that the play itself is a, a benefit for the person playing? Like it's really a good, it's really helpful to you. And then it's also a way for the therapist to understand what's going on with the person. Do you know what I mean? Like it is, is the action of playing with puppets itself a good in addition to being a, potentially. a communication. Yeah, of, I think, yeah. Potentially, yeah, yeah, potentially innately therapeutic, but also don't forget not, not all artists um, were mentally well, even though they were creating art, some of them 
you know, committed suicide, right? So, so the intervention of a therapist through their art might sometimes be in order. And we have sometimes actors or puppeteers who are traumatized by their own puppet play. Um, you know, they're, they're struggling through their own story. Maybe it's a very autobiographical story and working it through and maybe um, they have to abandon that performance or that role that they're playing because it's, it's unresolved for them. So, so it's potentially innately therapeutic but it isn't necessarily always. It could also sometimes be um, uh, wrong, you know, and, and not a good thing um, to be doing. Yeah, you know, in, the, in the trauma world, we talk a lot of, about the idea of making sure we don't over treat, right? Or yeah. we understand what's happening. And so what he's talking about, we, 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 would, we would frame as uh, we, we want to avoid re-traumatization right. because you can do more harm than good, if right. that makes sense. So that's, yeah. that's an example of the language we would use. The, the director I worked with for a really long time, uh, Peter Schumann, the director of the Bread and Puppet Theater, um, it were, uh, was a refugee during World War II. And you know the way um, he describes watching aerial bombardment and right. bodies washing up on shore of, uh, of, the, um, uh, of, of the sea, I, I think, He's had traumatic experiences. Absolutely. And, and yeah. to a certain extent, in a way, sometimes I think all of his theater is addressing this trauma that he had back in the 1940s. Right. And yeah. but it's totally irrelevant relevant, excuse me, because violence and you know, these things are repeating. But it's what we would call his trauma narrative, I yeah. guess. Right. That's the That's word right. that we would use. Yeah. And then also his repetition, repetition of form within the, the pieces. I happen yeah. to have Peter right here. <laughs> um, and I can, you know, just pull just one example, um, like this, for instance. So repetition of form. So, you know, having multiples of the same character, whether yeah. it's the women, whether it's the animals, you know, having multiples, many of the same, repeating them. And also ritual, the use of ritualistic movement, uh, ritualistic, you know, the scale, pageantry. Um, and we, we play with that both macro large ways as well as small and intimate. Again, are we working individual or group that could be intimate or are we working into the community where we have a large group of traumatized people like all who have been dealing with COVID or all who have experienced a war or all who have experienced a natural disaster. Can we work in a Peter Schumann way in a bread and puppet way with orchestrating and choreographing pieces where people are engaged in ritualistic process, process that, that is a, tr as a narrative and it comes to some kind of conclusion um, and repeating those more than once. These are ways to work. Uh, do you, it, in our world and at the museum, the Ballad <coughs> Museum sometimes, sometimes people have a phobia for puppets, like they have a reaction, sometimes of violence, yeah. but also sometimes like, I, I don't want to see this. Their puppets freak me out. Does that ever happen, Sandy, to you or to you, Matthew, that, that yes. people have a negative reaction? Oh, sure. Reaction? Well, part of that's a developmentally yeah. appropriate reaction, right? So me, again, with kids, um, working with kids, we have to understand developmentally where where different fears come up. But Matthew, most certainly in a therapeutic sense, yeah, and I would say adolescents and adults who have watched horror movies. Unfortunately, we've yeah, had well, some horror movies that have done a bad job on puppets and, as well as clowns. And um, I think so I've we'll said that throw... myself a few times. I'm sorry to say, yes. Yeah, but... and then we'll throw in masks as well, right? So, mm -hmm. so we've had to counteract that. Um, so, so handling the puppet, um, taking it apart and putting it back together. Some puppets come apart and go back together. Um, so, so becoming familiar with it as an object. Um, I remember once in a psychiatric unit with um, patients who, now we have patients in a hospital um, who might've been psychotic. And I thought, well, they might not really like the idea of puppets, that might be scary for them. But if they saw how this is the puppet head, this is the puppet body, we put them together and your hand goes here and you control it and make it work, then suddenly it wasn't so frightening because they're let oh. in on the world. It's, so it's not mysterious and, and secret. Instead, it's like, oh, I'm making this happen. And so empowerment and familiarity, you know, can be a way to help that along. Um, but again, there are some that would say, oh, absolutely not. Those freak me out. I'm not, I don't want to use it. 
So in my work, and I'm sure Sandy, you as well, we have lots of tricks up our sleeve. And so we wouldn't force it on anyone. I don't, just because I yeah. speak about therapeutic puppetry, I don't use it with everyone or suggest to use it with everyone. Um, but it, it has lots of benefit, but there are lots of other things that we use as well. I, I'd like to turn to the, the, the fascinating comments and questions we're getting from the audience and um, yeah. maybe do at this moment, turn to one of the recent ones and then go back to um, some earlier ones. Uh, by, by, for example, from uh, Noel Williams, one of our recent puppet arts graduate student graduates. So Gretchen Teague says, so at what point is it okay to work through your trauma through this type of performance? Yeah, so, so in what context? So, so are we talking about at what point is it okay for Gretchen or for a puppeteer or for someone, you know, just anywhere? Or are we talking about at what point is someone in therapy um, and not everyone in therapy is ready to work on their trauma? Um, she, said, so, she, she says, because there was mention of being cautious. Yes. So, right. Yes. Because I think the point is that when it, when using it um, is creating re-traumatization to the point where there's no healing, no learning, right. that's, okay. that's where the caution line draws. And that's a very individually determined situation that a therapist yes. would would help determine. I, that would be my answer. I don't know about Matthew. Yes, no, I agree. And and you're always assessing. Assessment doesn't only happen at the beginning of treatment. It's ongoing. Every session you're assessing is someone um, capable of, of what kind of work. So is it too real? Is it too close? Um, or is that exactly where they need or want to go? Someone might say, I'm going to tell you a dream. And we might enact the dream through puppetry. But they're bringing that dream into the session. Um, someone else, it's a drawing or a collage, and we might pull from that and puppetry is enacted out of that. But other times it's too real, it's too close and um, too active, and maybe a more passive and gentle approach is necessary. So we're always assessing and checking in, again, not forcing a, a technique or a process just because we think it's wonderful and exciting. There has to be a match. So we, we will say well-placed or well-timed the therapist is on the lookout for what seems well-placed and well-timed, and it's still trial and error. There are sometimes we could make a mistake and have to abandon and say, I'm sorry, you know, I can see you're overwhelmed. Let's perhaps stop this right now. And what do you need right now? And so this is part of the therapeutic relationship is, is checking in and interacting and engaging. Making sure level. there's psychological safety at safety. all times. Always yeah. safety. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Feeling, feeling safe. safe and positive. Yeah. I I see a lot of questions, John, and which I can't answer at all about um, credentialing. So I think yeah, Matthew was sure. interested in taking these on. I don't know if you wanted to read them out loud. Yeah, or... yeah so, I, so will, I will do that. Well, there's one right in front of me. I see it. Um, in the United <laughs> States, there is no career called puppet therapist. There are a few people that say they do puppet therapy, but there really isn't such a profession. Um, uh, we have um, psychologists, social workers, maybe even a child psychiatrist that might use puppets in their work and they might say they do therapeutic puppetry. Um, drama therapists, art therapists, play therapists certainly could use puppetry and say they do therapeutic puppetry, but none of us really are a puppet therapist or a puppetry therapist. Um, so we're all credentialed in some other discipline, a related mental health discipline, um, and in, choose to incorporate puppetry in the work. And um, so that credentialing could include a master's or doctoral level preparation academically. It could include, include licensure as a licensed professional counselor, licensed professional art therapist, a licensed uh, a social worker and so forth, a licensed clinical psychologist. It depends on the state and depends on the discipline. Different states have different rules, but yep. by and large, um, uh, we're, we're required to have some kind of education, higher level education and credentialing. We layer in the use of puppetry because we choose to, mm. because we believe in the work and see the benefit of it. Mm. In other countries though, there are people calling it puppet therapy. So you can go to Switzerland, there's an entire institute for puppet therapy. I taught there last summer, um, a five day course and people came from all over the world to attend that course. And um, but, but they will be hard pressed to go to many places and be a sort of a standalone clinician. Um, hopefully they are integrating that work into some other profession that they have credentialing for. 
Mm. Um, in Germany, there's uh, an institute. Um, in Finland, there's an institute um, where they're teaching therapeutic puppetry. And so their forms of credentialing are different across these different countries. Um, there is a, a certificate you can get in therapeutic puppetry in Chile. Um, and so you would want to look at these um, credentials and their, their curriculum. I've been making it a point of meeting all these folks. And so I've been traveling. I've been interfacing with them. Zoom has been great. We have all sorts of wonderful chats and comparing notes. Um, the field is kind of um, encroaching on itself. We're kind of finding common ground. And great. Um, artists are becoming therapists. Therapists are finding puppetry. So we're, that's what's happening. It's evolving. Hmm. Um, I wanted to get to uh, Noel Williams' question. Uh, sure. She said, uh, with many suggesting that we are headed into a mental health crisis from the yeah. effects of the pandemic and numerous artists out of work, do you think an intensive program could be created to equip artists with the tools to be able to work long term in schools, hospitals, and even community centers on an arts therapy and education level? Most artists do not have licensing or certifications to right. work in long-term positions in this capacity, which I am guessing is what would be needed for it to be effective. Funding right. would also be needed to both train artists and to create the positions within, excuse me, schools, hospitals, et cetera. Yeah. Um, you know, when we have, when we're talking about trauma or even just the effects of adjustment, you know, just adjusting uh, having adjustment disorder just, or just adjustment pain, right? Uh, adjustments to, to our conditions around us. Um, going to theater can be therapeutic, right? And so, um, so sure, there are people that are involved with arts and healing. Um, they're all forms of arts and healing. And um, so artists perhaps can think about what about my work could be therapeutic. I would suggest teaming up with mental health professionals for consultation. How can it might make my work more therapeutic? The storyline, maybe there's an uh, um, uh, um, after uh, performance talk, uh, uh, talk back, um, you know, uh, interviewing the performers or, or the artists in the creation of their work. Um, maybe the work is based on um, someone's uh, writing a story or a play um, and there's intention there that could be uh, explored and that also can have therapeutic gain. I would caution not to, um, uh, if you get work as a uh, artist in residence to not tr turn that into now I'm going to sort of be artist as therapist. I would <laughs> caution not to do that. I would say be an artist in residence and notice if some of the work seems uplifting. Is it more positive oriented, what we call more positive psychology? Are you, are you seeing, um, you know, lifting of mood, um, more positive self-talk, more sense of empowerment, less helplessness? Um, then that's, the, it, it's, yes, th therapeutic. It's potentially therapeutic. Um, don't call it therapy, but-, but not therapy, it, yeah. But yeah. not, th yeah. To see so it I as love, therapeutic. Yeah, I love that you brought that up, this up too. And I hope this is okay for me to bring in the new collaboration that that, that yes. our center, the Collaboratory on School and Child Health is yes. doing, is starting with the Ballard Museum. Um, again, based on a piece that, that one of us had written, it, this collaboration started that we know that kids, that students right now are struggling emotionally. We need, we've lost our social connections. We have this, this large sense of loss. Everyone needs yeah. kind of the simple toolbox of emotional well-being strategies. So we're, right. we're just beginning our partnership to do this integration of, of puppetry and using building puppets and, and applying uh, um, simple emotional strategies to yeah, help yeah. you in your everyday life and you could uh, that can be done in remote learning in in-person learning with families right. or with teachers so I'm really excited about this collaboration so that's an example of how puppeteers can work with mm. therapeutic great. folks in collaboration great I that's would I would echo that absolutely and here at Eastern Virginia Medical School we have arts for optimal health Mm -hmm. And we've been also playing with the idea of co creatively coping with COVID. So um, everything, That's a good from, frame. Yeah, everything <laughs> from self-care through things like visual journaling that you can do mm -hmm. on your own at home and chronicle your experiences um, to actual uh, projects, workshop format projects um, that are geared towards various population groups and um, often grant funded and that sort of thing. So um, mm -hmm. moving towards community and community arts. So um, I love the idea of collaborative work. And I think that's a way, especially with grant projects, 
to build into the grant to enlist um, artists who want to be uh, players in that field. And um, they can work collaboratively with a mental health professional in this idea of working pairs um, if the funding's available to do that. We do believe that artists should be paid for their work. And obviously we think therapists should be paid for their work, but we're all wanting to, with intention to be of help and service of others. So, so can we find a balance you know, for all of that? But absolutely, I think collaborative work is a great way to consider it to happen. So it, it sounds, uh, I, I feel like uh, we're benefiting that at the Ballard Institute um, from, from Sandy's program's insight in, into what's needed in, in, in local um, schools right now. And it seems to me that we're benefiting from your interest in working with puppeteers who are not, who are, it's a, two of our graduate students actually, who, who are not, at, trained in therapy, they're, they're very good puppeteers. And then this collaboration involves your program's understanding that puppetry can do some really good work. So it seems like, yeah. is that unusual, do you think, for a program like yours to say, oh yeah, we should work with puppets? Like, cause that would be good well, for Noel maybe the, and maybe other the, people. Yeah, maybe the puppet part, cause it wasn't something that just uh, automatically came to me, but our whole, all, all, our entire group is built on the premise that we can do better when we do interdisciplinary work. We see synergy of effects. So it's just super exciting to, let's just say, you know, I may, maybe, maybe I can call myself creative, but we'll, we'll call myself not creative, right? So I have this, this strategy that I want to, to apply and use in different populations and being able to work with your students, putting my postdoc with your students, um, to take that and run with it in, a cre in creative ways that we, I, that I wouldn't necessarily dream of or think of. And so yeah. it's an interesting back and forth of learning on both parts on, on how we could enhance, enhance each other's, ex, use each other's expertise to enhance the work that we each do. That's yeah. the way I like to put it. <laughs> yeah. And I have found that to be true again in other countries. I'd like to see more of it here in the United States. So I found it in Finland, Switzerland, and in Brazil, where I was um, you know, brought in in each of these locations and taught workshops or courses and did consultation. And so I had opportunity to talk with people across, uh, even nursing students, helping uh, uh, kids to use their inhaler for asthma. They did a research mm -hmm. study that used puppets to help the kids to do that. Um, yep. And so, um, so that collaborative work, I think, is really great. And I think we should look more interdisciplinarily in, in doing that. I think it's really a good thing. Our friend Car Carol Sterling, who's uh, done a lot yes. of work with puppetry and education in um, New York City schools, I think in Brooklyn, um, yes. more than other places, and is a lovely, lovely uh, friend of the Ballard Institute. She writes and asks, what personal qualities do you think a person who wants to be a therapist with an emphasis on using puppetry should have in order to be successful in your field? Uh, well, I would say just to be a therapist, certainly those who um, uh, can listen, being empathic, um, non-judgmental, non-judgmental, yeah. And um, now we're very um, in tune or more in tune with cultural humility um, and, um, you know, with um, social context and postmodern thinking. Um, this doesn't always mean that. There are many ways of knowing and many ways of understanding on multiple levels one's experience or others experience. So those who are more open-minded to those, um, not so guarded and stuck in their way is the only way, but that they're, you know, actually excited about, you know, learning about others and, and, and open to others' experiences in the world. Um, and Maybe open I'll, to being creative and play as yes, well. It has to have absolutely. a foundation of interest in play. Yeah, uh, we often say, check your, check your adult at the door <laughs> and bring your child um, to the session, your child self to the session. Um, so yes, of course, you're being responsible and ethical and professional, but yet the childlike part of yourself must be present in order to interact, even when working with adults, not only when working with children, but, but there's that we're tapping into the child part of ourselves. We often have to unlearn some bad habits and let down our adult defenses and guard to find the child within that needs the voice. And uh, children do these things more naturally, and then they're told to shut up and stop acting like a child, right? 
and stop playing and uh, be responsible, stop playing. And so we, if we can also be that person who could be more childlike and bring our clients along in that way, that, that's a great quality. I think it's kind of built into puppetry in terms of exploring yeah. what puppets can do. I always think that, you know, especially when you're building your own puppets after you build them or when you're making a show, mm -hmm. um, in addition to having an idea of what you want to do in the show, there needs to be a point where you play like That's in a great. very open way, like children do, because you've got this you know, this puppet in, in your hand or in your hands and you, you're, you're learning about it. Like, well, what does it do? And That's you sort right. of have to do it without a sense of um, purpose in a way other than seeing what's possible. And to That's me right. that in a way like puppeteers and maybe all artists are like this, you know, you, you, you need to play, you need to have open-ended play right. in order to get at some brilliant insight you have about what the puppet can can do and that's often the starting place in therapy is playing with the puppet in a non-scripted way we literally are devising theater the stories being told go. in sessions are like devised theater it's a lot of improv and it's a lot of yes and yes and and so so you're you're, you're using those mechanisms even therapists who have no idea what i just said are doing that because in their training in, in therapy or in play work, they are using these mechanisms from theater. Um, so, so being open to possibilities and playing, absolutely. And seeing what can the, what, even what character evolves, what voice comes out or what movement comes out that was not intended when you built the puppet. And suddenly this is not who you thought it was. So you're meeting sometimes a part of yourself in the puppet, or you're meeting another in your life or your world that you didn't realize was gonna show up today. And so, so as the therapist, I'm open to that possibility and I'm engaging my client in an experience of that happening for them and saying, wow, what just happened? Who just showed up? So we dialogue about the experience. So we have the experience and then we talk about the experience. So we're, we're we, a fancy term is phenomenological. So we're looking at a lived experience. We create a lived experience of being in the world and we're, we're creating an, a worlding experience in the sessions just like you would on stage, that's a world. You're creating a lived experience in the world. You're taking the audience on the ride in that world. And then when we have things like immersive theater, or if we go to visual arts, to installation art, like your Holocaust example, um, that theater also is more like immersive theater or installation, or even site-specific theater, site-specific art. You're creating a world and you're inviting others to be in that world. But then on our therapist side, we say, yes, but we have a responsibility to take them there safely. So how do we create that as a safe place and uh, create what we call a holding environment? How do you create a space that's conducive to safety and therapeutic gain and not something that's like going to, you know, razzle them? You know, sometimes I see artists are irresponsible in their work. They want to stir up an audience and leave them undone. And then the show's over and you say, what just happened? What did I just watch? Or you go to a gallery and see art on the wall and you say, what did I just see? And I think sometimes that's so jarring that it's actually irresponsible. Um, mm -hmm. And I think uh, uh, to answer that question about how artists or puppeteers can make their work more therapeutic is to answer that question, does it resolve? Is it more universal and archetypal? Is it understood by others? Or is it so idiosyncratic and personal that you get it, but you don't really care if anyone else gets it. That perhaps is maybe a little bit too much for mm -hmm. others to see. So, so can you take your work and, and pass it across others and do others relate to it? And is it making sense across others and um, shared experience? Um, so that's yeah, what might be more therapeutic. Can I jump in? Oh, yeah. sorry. No, no, no. Go jump in for one second, because I'm watching the chat as well. And I just wanted to give a super big shout out to all the educators who came on to this. Yay. Uh, to this tonight um, and who have commented on seeing applications to the work that they're doing and, and things that they might be able to incorporate in, in right. creating social emotional safety um, in their classrooms because this is, a, this is a tough space right now. So I wanted to give a quick shout out and I think Marisol has asked a, quite a few questions that I'm not sure I have the answer to in terms of, okay. there isn't necessarily a list of therapists that you could refer people to that use puppets or, or, or 
be, it, or is there? I mean, I don't know of one in Connecticut. My suggestion would be that you talk with the school mental health people that are in your building to see if what they what they have for recommendations and who they might know in the communities. But I don't know if you have a different answer, Matthew. Yeah. Um uh, there are lots of therapists who use puppets in therapy. Not all of them teach and write, and so it's hard to isolate and find them. So I can list a handful of them. Um, you know, I can say who's out there. Um, and actually, some very different approaches and styles are listed, you know, could be explored. Um, I see this one reference here also to working with people with autism and mm -hmm. um, the hand in healing, the power of expressive puppetry. Yes, I know this book. And also, um, uh, Carrie Marshall's book from Scotland, working with um, uh, uh, people with dementia in assistant living settings, um, working very uh, um, uh, nonverbal and ethereal and so forth. Um, so there's, uh, there are people all over that are doing these things, but uh, there are only a handful who are as vocal um, uh, and writing about it. There's also Melissa Trimmingham in, in England. She's writing about autism and the brain and puppetry. Mm -hmm and um, the tactile handling of objects and its effect on the brain, very fascinating. And its relation to literally object relations, which is a term from right. therapy and developmental psychology, but it's also object theater and object puppetry. Mm -hmm. So um, she's writing about that from a theater artist perspective who's studying autism. Um, so there are some great, I would Google these terms. Um, anyone could by all means be in contact with me um, I would love to email and be in contact with you and give you some uh, keywords to look up or references as a teacher. I'm always loaded with lots of suggestions there. Um, Should we be posting your, I can, I can your put, uh, website or something? I can put my email address right here in the chat. I'm, I'm fascinated by the way this is like a Venn diagram of puppeteers and educators and therapists mm -hmm. Yeah, you are finding that's right a commonality with I think the use of puppets. Um, that's so fascinating. It, it's fascinating that puppeteers are wanting to know. Well, how could this work we do connect with uh, with, with therapy? I think puppetry and and education is much more commonly known. Um, uh, are there other aspects of the questions coming in, Sandy, that, that you are noting? Um, um, I, I do, like AJ Rice as a LCSW, which is I think a licensed social worker. Social worker. Yes. I was wondering if you knew of any CEs to incorporate puppets and therapy. What is CE? Oh, that's a good uh, question. Continuing education yes. credits to maintain uh, your license. Yes. Well, um, I love to teach uh, workshops and courses. And before COVID, I used to get invited all over. So um, when it's safe or to do it this way um, through Zoom, um, I'd be glad to, personally to be invited to speak and to teach and to do sh uh, short courses. Um, Are there and conferences or places that you would go though that would um, also offer part of like uh, the, the, yeah, sometimes. the CE or credential? Yes. Some, sometimes. So um, some universities or schools that have art therapy programs or drama therapy program might offer a, a course or a okay. workshop or a conference. And then if you attend that, you could get your CEs or CEUs. Right. Um, uh, sometimes the organizers of an event will have arranged for in connection with a, 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 a academic institution to have the CEs offered. Um, so, I mean, I've taught even as like in Canada in a hotel room, but the people there that organized it connected it to, you know, some place that could offer CEs or CEUs, what have you. There, um, there have been a couple of questions relating to um, autism and autism yes. spectrum. And this is fascinating for me because I know from talking of, from puppeteers who work with Sesame Street, and I know from our own uh, Puppeteers of America National Festival and other, other Puppeteers of America festivals that I've gone to as a puppeteer, there's a very big community of um, uh, people on the autism spectrum who are attracted to puppetry. And yes. one of the wonderful things I found in these festivals is how puppeteers as a community are so welcoming to yeah. uh, um, the aut autist 
aut autistic community or pe people yes. with <laughs> with autism it's i found it very moving in fact the way that the puppet festival is a extraordinarily safe space and happy space for people I, I i'm assuming i am imagining around the spectrum to yes, people with I, diverse needs I, yes, I agree. diverse so, abilities yes i agree and um there was a question in there um uh I mean, it seems to me uh, the situation of diverse needs are the what i think of if i'm using the right term you know the autism spectrum um that seems to be a little bit different from puppetry and therapy per se, but do you, what is your sense of, of the, these connections between puppetry and those diverse spectrum situations? Yeah, I'm that's using a the right language. topic. Uh, Sandy, do you have some comments there? I have some, but I'll... Uh, no, no, you can go ahead. I was going to bring okay. something up, but go ahead. Um, well, first of all, um, yes, absolutely. I've been at those, as you know, those festivals and see this connection. And I think it's amazing and wonderful. Um, and um, the idea of uh, working with uh, an external object that's animated and the, the mechanism of how they work and so forth is, is attractive on sometimes on that level, but also for other reasons of why puppets and puppetry is, is of interest. Is it educational? Absolutely. Can it be therapeutic? Absolutely. Um, are sometimes people on the spectrum coming to therapy? Yes, sometimes they are. We aren't, in fact, making people not autistic because of therapy, but someone who has mm -hmm. autism or um, other related difficulties or challenges. Um, with might social be situ yeah, with social situations. Exactly. So maybe that's important for the, this community here to understand what are some that's of the right. characteristics of of, yeah. of people who to have autism spectrum disorder. Um, yeah. It's a, the, a key character, this, ah, characteristic is the challenge with yeah. social social situations social cues, and social. interpersonal communication. Yeah. 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 And so that might be worked on. Um, it's, it's then therefore very common to suggest to do group work um, so that you are engaging people with social activity and you have opportunities, sort of like a social lab. Um, so let's collaborate together doing puppetry and let's learn from each other. Well, is there another way you could ask that question? Is there another way you can tell someone you don't like his puppet? Um, is there, you know, so there's experiences that can be um, addressed in the moment. Yeah, and yeah. Um, that happens in therapy anyhow, but uh, puppetry yields to that. It, it really is. A yeah, because you're, you're taking it. situations and you're practicing them. It's a, a it's yes. a, something we do in, in with books in, in terms of social right. story. They're called so, social stories. Right. So you're watching the character in a situation, and you're right. being able to practice being part of that and playing That's out right. how how to um, how to play it out in a safe again in a safe yeah. way. But in old school, we would just say role play. But in uh, if we borrow, if today, if we borrow from theater arts and filmmaking, we would use the word rehearsal. So we we'll, we'll, so we have rehearsal, and then we'll let's let's take two, you know. So second yep. take, let's try that again. How would we yep. do that differently? Let's play that differently. And yep. so yep. take two, take three, and so you can kind of layer in sort of the fun of those uh, ideas of of how film is made and how TV is made and 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 you know how a film uh, play is directed um therapists do often uh take on a role like a director but actually more like a dramaturg um there's a lot of kind of creating the the mm -hmm. feel of the experience it's more dramaturgical than it is directing this we don't tell people what to do but we sort of consider dramaturgically the the experience what what it might feel like or the intention and what's what are we hoping to people to get out of the experience and I think even more so like a filmmaker where we can consider points of view and perspectives. Mm -hmm. um, that's, you know, I think of Fellini, you know, very much a Fellini approach to therapy sometimes. So to, to a degree, I feel that, I mean, I mean, if the autism spectrum are very wide and included all of us, I feel like puppeteers, we as puppeteers, in a lot of ways, we prefer to communicate through objects, you know, like that's why we do it. And very often puppeteers, and um, for some reason I'm thinking of the, like I think the one time I met Jim Henson, like that, um, I, I don't know 
what his situation is, but you know, he seems like a very quiet person. And then you think of the characters he did as sort of wild and right. crazy. Right. And, and I think for all of us, you know, we're, you know, like our friends who are operating with the autism spectrum, like we also, yes. um, you know, but there's another prefer way to pr to communicate with yeah to express ourselves through that way so there's something very interesting about that that's there that's there's another way to talk about this other than um autism when you're referring to sort of the normalization of parts of self and that would be um the work of roberto assagioli that he called psychosynthesis but more simply it's just the idea that we all have parts of self uh, and uh, there are other um, approaches that look at our child self, our adolescent self, our parent self. There are different, you know, systems of understanding, you know, parts of self. And sometimes different parts need a voice at different times. It's not that you're you're um, having full on different identities, um, but but that there's times that the way we interact with our friends is not the way we interact with an intimate partner, not the way you interact with your boss. And so. What dialogue is used? What tone of voice is used? What mannerisms are used? And puppetry rehearses all of those. It gives absolute opportunity to even have fragments of, of moments in our life, memories, reflections, as well as full developed characters. And puppetry just simply lends itself to all those possibilities. Great. <laughs> I, I'm uh, the, uh, 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 a question Noel Williams asked earlier on, and we only have a few minutes left here, but she said, are gaming techniques and concepts also considered elements of play? Gaming techniques and concepts, no. not sure exactly what that is. And are they applicable to therapy as well? Thinking along yeah. the lines of Super Better by Jane McGonigal. And I'm not sure what the connection is to puppetry here, but I'm-, I'm Well, I'll give this a shot that. because I've been quoted. <laughs> People have lifted all sorts of quotes from my book, from our book. Uh, there are 28 authors in that book, so it's a very collective work. Um, but in, in video gaming, there's actually lifted, you know, about symbolic play on the idea of an avatar, you know, taking on a role, um, which character are you and building the character the way in, and I don't even play video games, but you know that some of those games where you, you start off as sort of a neutral character and then you layer on what kind of character you become and um, what role do you play and even reversing roles or changing roles. So um, in terms of gaming, yes. And I think the people who create gaming um, are in that mindset of, you know, these parts of self and parts of characters and roles and similar to fairy tales where, you know, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, you know, they only have one outfit, you know, so Snow White only, always looks like Snow White. She's got sort of a flat personality and each of the dwarves are just that one, you know, character. But, but in these games, they get more developed. Personalities are much more layered and multi-layered. And, and, uh, and I think that's an appeal for people. Um, the negative side of it that I don't like, of course, is a lot of violence in the games and um, also not a lot of realism. People get killed and they come right back to life. Um, and so I am concerned about the, uh, the impact of excessive violent uh, play, especially by kids who are too young to be playing adult gaming. Um, <clears throat> so I have that concern and caution. But um, I think absolutely the idea of game, video game uh, creation and characters um, in fact, I attended a, um, a course in collaborative puppetry in Canada at the BAM Center, and one of the participants was a game designer. And so I was curious about how he and he was bringing what he was learning to his staff and also the role of play and how that might build more creative process in game development. thought that was a very fascinating, um, whereas others were very interested in theater and I was the therapy person and, you know, there were different people in this group. It was very fascinating. Sandy, does, does game design come up in, in, in your approaches or your work? Um, I can't say not, not too much, really. Some, uh, um, so we've had some students recently that have become interested in the idea of uh, video, video self-modeling and using mm -hmm. uh, VSRM um, devices to uh, work to improve uh, different behaviors like stuttering. And some of that is very interesting, but not the right. idea of uh, certainly therapy in, in vid using video games. Yeah. I mean, there are lots of debates and that's probably a whole nother forum, not for today, yeah. for today in terms yeah. of uh, spaces for video games in, in 
learning yeah. and movement. Well, I'm well, glad you new... mentioned that because <laughs> our, yeah. our forum on Thursday, oh, right. April 22nd is yeah. gonna be about puppetry, game design and digital performance. Got it. Um, yeah. With some, from our ver some folks from our very large digital media and design mm. department yeah. and Eddie Kim, so. Well, yeah. that'll be a fun one. Yeah. Just throwing and that we in. We have new works in art therapy, published works about um, digital work and um, computer programs and, and so forth, uh, um, computer generated art making and, and so forth. And so I think that digital world is interfacing now in therapy in that way. Um, it would be interesting to see how it develops. We're sort of at the end of our program okay. here and um, Oh, uh, we've, I think we've posted, uh, I think my colleague uh, Emily has posted uh, information of, about uh, contacting Matthew. Uh, great interest here in learning more about puppetry and, and therapy, uh, and especially trying to find out who's doing that, which is really exciting. And um, I'm very grateful to, to Sandy too for, um, for the work that the, uh, we're doing together, um, the, the, the NEAG School and the, the Ballard Institute in this project. Um, and I hope uh, we'll, we will be doing more of that. So do you, what, what do you think? Do you have, what are your, your final brilliant thoughts about <laughs> puppetry and therapy to share with our audiences here? Well, I, th I think for me to be sure to interface, I think that's, um, that's been coming up in our discussion and from seeing the variety of participants, um, uh, cross-disciplinary, interdisciplinary, and uh, now I've been using the term transdisciplinary. I didn't, didn't mm -hmm. invent it, but I think it's a great one. We're crossing above and beyond, across and beyond um, our disciplines for the better and development of each of our professions and our applications. Um, so um, keep talking with each other, asking questions. Don't stay siloed in your own discipline, but cross out. I think the best work is coming out of the interfacing across disciplines. Absolutely. So I think that's probably the most brilliant point for the night, but my most second brilliant <laughs> point would be that um, to, to be well and do whatever it takes to be well right now, whether that's Thank puppets you. or something else, like getting yeah. outside or doing whatever it is that you can find. Um, I love your turn, Matthew, that you said uh, creative, what was it? Creative, creative, creative coping, coping with, COVID. with COVID. Creative yeah. coping in COVID and creative can be in any way, shape or form that, that's important. Yeah. And if you're not coping well, then please reach out for help because help is there and, and you can find it. Yeah, and in, in Connecticut, we, you would just dial 211 for some help. Um, right. So please right. make sure. Thank you. I, I, I didn't know if, if my colleague Emily wants to come in to say goodbye. Um, here <laughs> she, she is. is. Thank you. Um, so our, our next, uh, well, well, we haven't scheduled the First Nations Object Performance uh, Forum, which we hope will be in March. And then after that, March 25th, Puppetry and Spirituality. But uh, please uh, refer to our Ballard Institute website and our Facebook page. You can make a donation if you like. I'm deeply uh, thankful to, to Sandy and to Matthew for, for sharing uh, your approaches to puppetry tonight. And thanks to Emily awesome. for making everything happen. And we'll, we'll see everybody later on the internet. Thank you all so much. It's been a treat to be involved. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.